The issuer banks were on the verge of failure. You and other executives tried to cash out. SVB executives, including Mr. Becker in front of us today, dumped millions of dollars in company stock in the days leading up to the crash. Millions of dollars in company stock in the days leading up to the crash. You were paying out bonuses until literally hours before regulators seized your assets. To people in Ohio and around the country, this feels sickeningly familiar. To most Americans, a lack of Wall Street accountability tracks with their entire experience with our economy. Workers, workers face consequences. Executives ride off into the sunset. Only in corporate boardrooms can you run your business into the ground, take the whole economy along with you, and come out ahead. We can't let that happen again. Both your banks prioritize fast growth, but not risk management. Both of your banks pushed up your stock prices and your own executive compensation, but didn't address the glaring risk from, from company, from, I'm sorry, from customer and industry concentration. When you put other people's money in our broader economy at risk, there must be accountability for that level of mismanagement. Running a bank, as you know, or should know, running a bank isn't like running any other company. If you manage a car parts business or a steel company and run, and as I spoke to some steel executives today, you run into the ground, you and the employees lose your jobs. The surrounding community may get hurt, but there usually aren't broader consequences for the savings accounts of families all around the country. With your jobs, other people's money is at stake. That's why we recognize that banking is different and why in return banks are subject to stricter rules or they're supposed to be. Our committee's looking at ways to impose real accountability on those most to blame for big bank failures, the bankers themselves. It's why we discussed ways to increase accountability at last week's hearing. It's why we brought the three of you together today to answer the mistakes you clearly made at these banks. Learning more about what went wrong will help us craft the strong, po strongest possible rules to prevent more of these failures. We know, of course, there's blame to go around. Your risk-taking was aided by former Federal Reserve Vice Chair for Supervision, Randall Quarles, who led the regulatory rollbacks in 2018, 2019, 2020. It's clear those rollbacks emboldened bank executives to take on more risks. This all comes back to the power of your industry. From the rules that big banks, including yours, lobbied to weaken to the impunity with which executives have been allowed to operate, the largest banks and the people who run them have been impervious to consequences for far too long. We need to change that beginning now. Senator Scott. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The last two months have shaken the banking sector. Not only did we experience three of the largest bank failures in American history, we also found out that our banking regulators were utterly asleep at the wheel. And as I've said repeatedly, there are three major issues with bank failures. First was bank mismanagement, supervisory failure, and rocketing inflation. I am thankful that this committee has been able to come together to conduct the type of oversight that is necessary for us to understand and appreciate the depth of the mismanagement and the challenges that have been presented to the American people. And while today's bank focus will be on the management, Thursday, we'll have an opportunity to talk about the supervisory failures. My Democratic colleagues will avoid the economic failure that landed us where we are today. When you spend and print trillions of dollars, leading to the highest inflation we've seen in my lifetime, with 10 interest rate hikes is what happens. 10 interest rate hikes in about a year sends a signal of what is actually happening in the marketplace that seems to have been completely ignored by the bank execs. On top of that, our colleagues on the left have decided to make Jared Bernstein, the architect of the Biden economy and the Biden failure, the chairman of the CEA. But today, it's high time that we figure out what went wrong from a bank management perspective. It is critically important that we understand how our banking system experienced two of the largest failures in the history. That starts with getting answers from y'all. I'd like to start with Mr. Becker. I ran a business for a while, and I'll tell you, honestly, I'm shocked at the complete negligence and disregard for the economic realities that this country was facing. Under your leadership, SVB, made significant bets on interest rates falling when everything indicated exactly the opposite. 
I'm not an economist. I old, owned insurance agencies. But anyone that paid close attention to the economy over the past two years could have plainly seen that the Federal Reserve was going to continue to increase interest rates. Truth be told, I don't think you need to be an economist or an insurance guy or senator to understand the direction, the trajectory of the interest rate hikes that we were going to see. But there was a J.P. Morgan analyst <clears throat> that said that SVB was already in trouble. I remember a blogger, a financial blogger, I think it was November of the previous year, came to the same conclusion that the portfolio risk was very high and increasing. So I hope to hear your analysis on why you did not act on the ballooning risk and how you failed to adapt to the increasingly vulnerable inflationary environment that impacted your bank. And more importantly, the customers of your bank. The Federal Reserve report noted that your bank's practices did not keep pace with the rapid growth in size and in risk. Further, the Federal Reserve's report also stated that the Board of Directors and risk management's experience and capabilities were lacking for a bank of $200 billion. Not only did you fail to hire a chief risk officer in a timely manner, and the definition of timely manner is several months the bank went, went without its chief risk officer in place. That challenge exacerbates the situation that Americans came to realize. To me, it sounds like a recipe for disaster. And sadly, in part, it's why we are here today. Even more concerning, the Federal Reserve's report <clears throat> stated that with respect to both liquidity and interest rate risk, your management team was more focused on chasing profitability than stability. Sounds like greed. Perhaps this is why your institution had 31 open supervisory findings when it failed, which is about three times the average number. That's 31 notices that you received, flashing red lights that something was desperately wrong. But let me say this, SVB was an anomaly. And your lack of judgment, Mr. Becker, shows that you should not have been running the bank. To the American people, our true regional institutions are run by smart, competent individuals, and your money is safe. It's no doubt that the failure of SVB fed the bank run, leading to the liquidity crisis that ended up creating the contagion that also impacted Signature Bank. Signature Bank's board of directors and management also pursued rapid, unrestrained growth without developing and maintaining adequate risk management practices and control appropriate for the size, complexity, and risk profile of the institution. Nor did the management prioritize good corporate governance practices. The, FD, the FDIC report further states that Signature Bank did not always abide by the FDIC examiner concerns and was not always responsive or timely in addressing FDIC supervisory comments and recommendations. Mr. Shea and Mr. Powell, Mr. Howell, I'll be eager to hear you tell me why you thought it was okay to not respond in a timely manner. The laws are not above you, so I'd like to understand why you thought they were. Like, if I said, like I've said before, as a Charlestonian, if a restaurant decided to ju just ignore the safety inspectors, I am confident they would be shut down and the management would be replaced. Americans watching this hearing today should see the examples of bad management and know that while we are demanding answers and hopefully we'll get something that sounds like an answer, this is not the norm. For the vast majority of our financial institutions, they are well run, our banking system is strong, 
and your money is safe. I thank the chairman for working with me to get these executives before us. I look forward to hearing their comments. Uh, thank you, Ranking Member Scott, and thank you for your cooperation on both sides, staff on both sides to work together for this hearing. I'll introduce today's witnesses. Greg Becker was the CEO of Silicon Valley Bank, was the president, chief executive officer of the SVB Financial Group, the holding company for the bank since uh, April 2011. He first joined SVB Financial Group 30 years ago. He served in a number of executive senior, man senior management roles. Mr. Becker, welcome. Thank you for being here. Scott Shea was co-founder of Signature Bank and served as chair of the board since its inception. Since 1980, Mr. Shea has been involved in the investment banking, commercial banking, and venture capital industries. Mr. Shea, welcome. Uh, Eric Hall was announced as president of Signature Bank February 16th of this year, effective March 1st, was to succeed Joseph DePaula as CEO after a transition period. Mr. Powell served as chief operating officer since July 2021, was a member of the board of directors at Signature since April 22. After Signature was shut down, he now serves as senior executive vice president at Flagstar Bank. Welcome, um, Mr. Hall. Initially, the committee contacted Senator Signature Bank's former CEO, Joseph DiPaolo, about testifying before the committee. When committee staff contacted Mr. DiPaolo's advisors, they explained a health issue to committee staff. While the committee is interested in understanding the management decisions at Signature, it's important for us to allow Mr. DePaula to deal with his health issues. Ranking Member Scott and I agreed the committee would hear from the two of you instead. Uh, Mr. Becker, please begin your testimony. Thank you. Chair Brown, Ranking Member Scott, and members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today. My name is Greg Becker, and I was the Chief Executive Officer of Silicon Valley Bank. I'm here today to answer your questions about what happened at SVB to the best of my memory. At the outset, I want to be clear that I never envisioned myself or SVB being in this situation. I was an employee of SVB for nearly 30 years and CEO for the last 12 until it was taken over by the FDIC. I believed in the bank and its mission, and I cared deeply about our more than 8,000 employees and their families. I was committed to our clients and helping them succeed, whether they were successful technology companies or small business founders in towns across the country. SVB was designed to meet the needs of the technology and life science industries, where startups and later stage companies could keep their deposits, borrow to expand their businesses, and create jobs. We knew our clients personally, understood their needs and goals, and partnered with them as they grew. We took risk management seriously and worked closely with and were responsive to the various regulators who oversaw SVB. Over time, we built and expanded a team of subject matter experts focused on analyzing risks and protecting the bank and continually sought to add operational expertise and experience to enhance our risk management as the bank and clients evolved. Much has been said about the takeover of SVB by the FDIC and why it happened. Ultimately, I believe that SVB's failure was brought about by a series of unprecedented events. Between 2015 and 2019, SVB grew from about $45 billion in assets to $71 billion in assets at an annual rate of about 10 percent. This changed in 2020 due to the COVID-19 pandemic and the government's stimulus measures. With near zero interest rates and the largest government-sponsored economic stimulus in history, more than five trillion of new deposits flooded into commercial banks. By the end of 2020, SVB had grown 63% over the prior year. And in 21, SVB's assets grew another 83% to 212 billion. To support this growth, SVB raised more than $8 billion of new capital in 2021. Importantly, throughout 2020 and late 2021, the messaging from the Federal Reserve was that interest rates would remain low and that inflation that was starting to bubble up would only be transitory. During this time, SVB invested in low-risk, highly rated government-backed securities. These securities were safe assets as they were backed by the U.S. government and could be used as collateral for borrowing for liquidity if SVB needed it. 
These fixed income securities complemented our short duration loan portfolio, approximately which 90% was variable rate. In fact, other U.S. banks collectively invested nearly 2.3 trillion of their securities portfolios in this low yield environment created by the Federal Reserve. To account for changing market conditions, namely higher interest rates for longer, on March 8th, we sold SVB's available for sale securities portfolio in a planned capital raise. Unexpectedly, on the same day, Silvergate Bank announced its intent to voluntarily wind down and liquidate, and depositors triggered a bank run. Despite stark differences in our business models, news reports and investors wrongly lumped SVB and Silvergate together. Rumors and misconceptions quickly spread online, culminating on March 9th with the first ever social media bank run, leading to $42 billion in deposits being withdrawn from SVB in 10 hours, or roughly $1 million every second. Over two days, approximately 80% of total deposits were requested to be removed from SVB. To put the unprecedented velocity of this bank run in context, the previous largest bank run in U.S. history was 19 billion in deposits over 16 days. In the face of these unprecedented events, the leadership team and I made the best decisions we could with the facts and forecasts available to us at the time and the best interests of SVB to employees and to clients. I worked at a place I truly loved, alongside our dedicated employees to support our clients who were innovating in astonishing ways. I believe that SVB had a positive impact on the roughly 100,000 companies we supported over multiple decades. The takeover of SVB has been personally and professionally devastating, and I'm truly sorry for how this has impacted SVB's employees, our clients, and our shareholders. And I hope that I can provide insights that will help this committee and the American public better understand what happened. Thank you. Uh, I'm sorry. If you proceed, Mr. Shea, thank you. Chairman Brown, Ranking Member Scott, and members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to be here to discuss Signature Bank and my role as chairman of the board. In 2000, I co-founded Signature Bank. At the time, the banking industry was experiencing many mergers and many big banks were not serving the needs of middle market customers. I felt that a mid-sized bank would provide an important commercial service to businesses that preferred a smaller, more personal banking experience. Signature Bank followed a single point of contact approach. Which, in which the bank's clients teams personally served the needs of small and medium-sized businesses. Our bank had a diverse group of clients, including industrial companies, commercial real estate firms, healthcare providers, professional service firms, nonprofits, and many others. We placed a priority on providing financing to affordable housing providers in low and moderate income areas, and did so for many years. Through the hard work and dedication of our employees, we went from a small bank with 40 million of startup funds to a successful middle market bank with more than $100 billion in deposits. We were a solid and thriving bank that played an important role in our clients' businesses, and I was enormously proud of our success. In 2018, we began accepting deposits from businesses in the digital asset sector. I supported this effort because I believed that the digital assets payment systems can make financial transactions faster, easier, and cheaper with funds moving from place to place in minutes rather than hours or days and at a much lower cost than traditional payment systems. I was not alone in my enthusiasm for digital assets. Over the years, many other banks and financial institutions and money managers have entered the market for digital assets and governments both state and federal, have expressed support as well. As with other parts of Signature Bank's business, digital deposits grew over time. Nonetheless, because this was a relatively new sector, Signature Bank carefully monitored the business in an effort to ensure that clients met our internal standards, including for compliance with anti-money laundering laws. We also limited the kind of business we would do. Signature Bank's digital business was focused on accepting U.S. dollar deposits 
from businesses in the sector. Additionally, I publicly supported increased government regulation of the digital assets sector in order to ensure that businesses operating within the sector had regulatory oversight. In the latter part of 2022, the digital asset sector experienced increased volatility and regulators expressed concerns. Signature Bank took these developments seriously and in just a few months significantly reduced its digital asset deposits. Unfortunately, a series of truly extraordinary uh, and unprecedented events, of full, events unfolded quickly. On March 7th, the bank with strong ties to the digital asset sector announced it was going out of business, and three days later, a second bank, Silicon Valley Bank, was seized by regulators. And then, within just a few hours, our depositors withdrew $16 billion from the bank. Nonetheless, I was confident that Signature Bank could withstand the economic earthquake that occurred that day. The bank was well capitalized. The bank was solvent. Indeed, it was always solvent, with assets well in excess of liabilities, even at the very end. And the bank had a well-defined and solid plan to continue in operation and withstand additional withdrawals. Although I believe the bank was in a strong position to weather its storm, regulators evidently saw things differently. On Sunday, March 12th, regulators seized Signature Bank. Although I disagreed with this decision, I recognize the important role that bank regulators play in our financial system. My first priority to help Signature Bank, to build, my first priority in helping to build Signature Bank was to provide excellent service to our customers. I was therefore pleased that the government guaranteed the full amount of our customers' deposits. Helping build a bank that for 22 years played an important role in the middle market sector of, econ of our economy was the pinnacle of my professional life. For that reason, March 12, 2023, was a devastating day for me. Thank you, Mr. Shea. Mr. Hall, thank you for joining us. Good morning, Chairman Brown, Ranking Member Scott, and members of the committee. I grew up in Orange County, New York. After graduating high school, I worked to pay tuition while attending the State University of New York at Albany. It was there that I met my wife, Amy. After graduation, I entered the banking industry, first working at Republic National Bank as a staff auditor. I worked in various positions at Republic for nearly eight years and joined Signature Bank in 2000. At Signature, I started as the bank's controller and through years of hard work, rose through its ranks. I later served as the bank's chief financial officer for several years and was promoted to a position in corporate and business development. In that role, I worked to help the grow the bank's core client base of small to medium-sized businesses, and led the addition of experienced banking teams, both in the bank's traditional New York market, as well as our expansion to California and Nevada. In 2021, I transitioned to the role of Chief Operating Officer, and was given responsibility for bank operations and processing our clients' activities. In April 2022, I joined the bank's board of directors, and on March, 20, on March 1st, 2023, 11 days before the bank was seized, I was appointed president of the bank. Having worked at Signature Bank for more than 20 years, it was profoundly disappointing to see the bank seized and closed. The unprecedented events of March 10th, 2023, including the speed and amount of withdrawals that afternoon, astonished the bank. I believe the bank was well capitalized, solvent, and had sufficient borrowing capacity to withstand these and future withdrawals. I was disheartened that this did not come to pass. However, it is reassuring that the FDIC guaranteed the full amount of the bank's clients' deposits. When Greg Carmichael was appointed by the FDIC to oversee Signature Bridge Bank, I was asked to stay on as President and Chief Operating Officer. In those roles, I worked to ensure the ongoing operations of the Bridge Bank and assisted in securing a sale of assets and liabilities to another bank. I'm continuing to work hard for our clients as they transition to this new bank, maintaining the relationships on which they rely, and I am proud to have played and continue to play a significant role in preserving employment 
for approximately, for approximately 2,000 of my colleagues. Now I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, thank you, Mr. Hall. I have questions for all three of you. I assume the ranking member also. Mr. Becker, SVB experienced astounding growth from, 19, from 2019 to 2021. Assets grew 198, 198%, six times the median growth for comparable banks. When SVB was growing fast, did it ever occur to you that new deposits funding that rapid growth could leave the bank as quickly as they came in? Senator, when the growth was occurring, I think it's important to note that the, the growth was from existing clients. So yes, we added new clients, but it was mainly our existing clients were raising uh, more substantial am amounts of, of money. And so we built several things. One is we added to our liquidity, making sure that we had borrowing capacity so that we could support an outflow of deposits that would occur. But again, I think it's important to note that was mainly from existing clients. Um, by every measure, you, you know, by every measure, that kind of growth may sound good to Wall Street, but for most bank managers, it means more risk factors to keep track of. When your bank failed, it had 31 unresolved matters requiring attention, the Fed's term, 31 huge red flags identified by regulators. I think it's safe to say rapid growth was not because Silicon Valley Bank was six times better than other banks. Uh, Mr. Howell. Once you started new business lines, it was important to show investors that Signature Bank could still be profitable. Is that right? Profitability was certainly something that we always looked at. It seems like big losses in a struggling stock price motivated management to jumpstart profits and boost the stock price. In doing so, it, you just didn't seem to care about, about uh, increasing obvious risks. Um, Mr. Becker, your version of events blames SVB's failure on too many interest rate hikes, a social media-driven bank run, the closure of the much smaller Silvergate Bank, and the regulators for being slow to highlight its long-standing problems. It sounds a lot like the dog ate my homework. Your explanations ignore that your bank was without a chief compliant officer for the better part of a year. I don't think that was in your testimony. While you watched deposits leave and losses on long-term investment securities began to pile up, your version on that leaves out that you only tried to fix things when you were told that SVB was going to be downgraded. Is there any other explanation that you just wouldn't make any effort to fix the growing problems because it would have cut into earnings? Chair Brown, we took risk management seriously, and we both were proactive in risk management and also were responsive to the regulatory feedback. And I think in the GAO report, it outlined the responsiveness that we had. And I think um, if you have an opportunity to talk to the regulators that were directly involved, I think they would share that point of view. Regarding the chief risk officer, if I may add to that answer, um, we decided, the board and I, along with feedback from the regulators, that we were going to look for an um, even more experienced CRO. And in my experience, it takes six to nine months to find the best person for a role. We did two things to make sure that we had coverage while we were looking for a chief risk officer. First, we created an office of the CRO with the leadership team reporting to me and reporting to the chair of our risk committee. And secondly, we kept our chief risk officer on board as a consultant through October 1 to make sure there were no gaps during that period of time. Uh, Mr. Shea, I, I, one of Signature Bank's fatal flaws was a concentrated depositor base that made it, made it susceptible to a bank run. FDIC and New York banking regulators identified this as a problem. Signature Bank management assured them the bank's relationships and dedicated customer service would make customers less likely to flee. In the end, you bet on the hope that customers really, really valued that relationship, ignoring common sense risk management. The bank ended up with an extraordinary level of client concentration. The numbers, frankly, are hard to believe. 60 clients held 40% of total deposits, four depositors accounting for 14% of total deposits. Did you need that kind of concentration to make quick profits, Mr. Shea? The bank took steps to offset and ameliorate the concentration of high of, of uh, uninsured depositors. The bank set aside uh, an internal allocation of liquidity in order to offset or in order to provide an internal collateral measure of maintaining high quality assets against uninsured 
deposits. In addition, um, the bank uh, tried, the bank endeavored to diversify its deposit portfolio mix and maintain liquidity availability to offset those uh, higher concentrations of assets. Thank you, Sarah Scott. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Baker, <clears throat> you said you took risk management seriously. It's, it's hard to believe that comment as it relates to the uniqueness of your bank. Your bank had about 90% of its deposits uninsured. If you're taking risk management seriously, as you grow from $50 billion to over $200 billion in a very short period of time, as a guy who ran a couple of businesses that went from zero to several thousand clients, the one thing I had to do was figure out how to get out of my business so I could work on my business. When you're, when you're the CEO, you're working in the business. It's very challenging to see your own blind spots. You, you actually need a board and the ability to step out of your role and look on your overall organization to come to a conclusion, where is the risk? And when your bank is such an anomaly in an industry where 90 plus percent of your deposits were uninsured, how did you, how did you see that risk and then not respond to it? Uh, when you're a $50 billion bank, you don't have to worry about the stress tests. When you get to $200 billion, you should be constantly aware of what a stress test looks like and how do you pass that test. And so it's hard for me to appreciate that you're taking risk seriously when, in fact, the anomaly itself should have triggered a different type of stress test in your own mind, in your board's perspective as well. So walk me through how you missed that, because that, that is core to what our nation has experienced in now having serious doubts about our banking system. Senator, if I can make a, a few points. One is on the level of, of uninsured deposits. Uh, I've been at the bank or was at the bank for 30 years. And in my history, our clients have always had substantial amounts of cash. That's just the profile. So that's not something that happened in the last three years, four years, or five years. It's, it's always been that way. So we've, we tended to have, and I think the ratings that were given to us by the regulators would show that, that we had substantial amounts of liquidity. But that's, that's good. Let me ask you this question, Ms. Becker. If you look back <clears throat> 20 years ago, what was the uninsured deposits 20 years ago, 15 years ago? Senator, to my, to my recollection, the deposits were always, un, uninsured deposits were always roughly between 85 and 90 percent of our balance sheet. And the growth from 50 billion to 200 billion with that level of uninsured deposits did not trigger or something could be different at all? So the, let, me, let, me, let, me, let me add this to it. So uh, one of the things we have to do is learn to look outside of our industries for, for the anomalies that we may see within our industry. So when you see uh, Reddit and GameStop having the type of fluctuation that leads to massive increase in value and then precipitous drop, uh, looking around the world of technology and seeing that things are happening, how'd you factor all that in or did you factor it in? So, Senator, I, I think about it a couple different ways. One is our capital levels, and then our liquidity levels, and then just the advice and the expertise that we bring on board from, from other areas. That would be on the board, that would be on uh, additional management team members, and then finally, kind of the last line of defense I would think about it would be the regulators. And so when I looked at the capital, and we included that in the written testimony, our capital levels, and I think there's questions about capital, and I don't have any questions about capital right. as it relates to, to what happened. I have questions about liquidity because capital really wasn't the challenge that you faced. You had a, you had a concern and an issue that, of course, manifested itself in liquidity risk because of 10 consistently increasing interest rates hikes that made your liquidity crunch a real challenge. So look at it from just a liquidity perspective. Yeah. So to, to address that, I'm just going to speak from 2021 all the way to the end of 2022. We increased the liquidity, and as I think about it, it's both the cash that you have and your borrowing capacity, 300%. So at the end of the year, we had borrowing capacity of 69 billion, plus the cash that we had. You basically had liquidity of roughly $80 billion at the end of the year. And so again, as we looked at liquidity overall, relative to the size of bank we were, we certainly felt that we had ample liquidity. 
and we're able to, even with the fastest bank run in history, 41 of the $42 billion of deposit outflows that day, that Thursday, were covered by SVB. And we could have handled even more. We were moving collateral from the Federal Home Loan Bank to the Federal Reserve. The, the ability to cover that amount of liquidity or that amount of outflow, we certainly felt showed that we had ample liquidity. It's the unprecedented event, the fastest bank run in history, from our standpoint, that was the anomaly. Thanks, Senator Scott. Senator Warner of Virginia is recognized. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I know, I know I just heard the end of that question, but I do think this um, $42 billion in six hours uh, and how that was spurred on by the Internet and, frankly, some folks the night before merits some further consideration. But I do want to really thank you for holding this hearing today. Um, I know the committee's pushing forward in this analysis what went wrong at these banks and what regulators in Congress needs to do to make sure we don't do it again. I know we'll get the chance to see the regulators um, later this week. So today I would just want to say a few things about the management and the board oversight. Uh, as a former business owner, I feel very deeply that management of complex growing organizations is a 24-7, 365-day-a-year exercise. And I think the responsibility to employees and the public means that you don't let, let up when dealing with uh, the risk, and that means staying on top of your organizations and trying to make sure we always look around the corner about what's happening. Um, later this week, we'll obviously have a chance to look into supervision. However, the further we get into these postmortems, it feels to me, and, and I know people may have already raised this, that there was a failure, unfortunately, both institutions and Banking 101. Um, that in many ways, whether you all had been the size of the institutions or I just came from some more community banks in Virginia, if you've been institutions at $5 billion, there should have been warning signs on interest rate mismanagement. Um, the truth is, as well, both of your models, and, I, and I'm familiar with both of your banks, uh, had this really fast growth strategy and clearly took on the question about the number of and volume of uninsured deposits. Uh, and when we've got a changing risk interest rate environment, I would have thought that would have sent off some, some warning signs. And I know you're probably going to get asked lots of questions from lots of members on a variety of topics. I guess I want to focus my questions on governance and the role of the boards in both of your institutions. Um, the Fed report, I think, found, Mr. Becker, uh, at SVB, the Fed reported that growth far outpaced the abilities of the board and senior management. They failed to establish a risk management control infrastructure uh, for the size and complexity of your institution, both when you were smaller and then as you experienced this dramatic growth. The FDIC's report on signature states that the management's primary focus on growth, deposits, and profits took um, priority over responsibility to ensure sound risk management and responsive, responsiveness to supervisory recommendations. Um, I'm not probably going to get through all my questions since I see I'm down to two minutes, so I'm going to submit them for the record. I'd like to hear from all of you about how were your boards structured, and um, particularly as you had very pro-growth structured um, business models, how are the boards involved? And as you started to get these indications from the regulators that things seemed out of out of whack, how did your boards respond? And Mr. Becker, we'll start with you, and I guess go down the go down the road. Thank you, Senator. Uh, the board was very involved. Uh, you know, I bet was the CEO for 12 years, and, and the entire time, I would say we had a very active and engaged uh, board of directors. Uh, we had various committees that managed different responsibilities. We had a risk committee, we had a finance committee, we had a governance committee, we had a compensation, and we had an audit committee. And again, they were very actively involved. Uh, the finance committee was the, the main committee that had oversight of our asset liability committee, which is the subject of a lot of the questions that uh, have come up already and I'm sure will come up during the course of this, uh, this, this hearing. Um, in early 2022, we received feedback from the regulators that we needed uh, additional experience on the board, that we needed more LFI experience. We immediately, I know I was actively involved and the board was actively involved in recruiting an even stronger LFI-focused board of directors, which we had done 
and we did over the course of 22. So very engaged board and a responsive board. Can we hear signatures well? Signature Bank had a very active and um, very um, involved and engaged board that asked questions, challenged management, took the responsibilities, took its responsibilities seriously. It um, took the reports of the um, of the examiners, of the regulators very seriously. It also had, it had committees from risk to credit to examining, which was the audit committee that went into deeper. Well, well I've got a series of questions I want to put in for the record, Mr. Chairman, but respectfully, guys, if you had this many notices from the examiners, I would have thought somebody from the board would have been calling time out. This is a serious issue, and um, I've got questions for the record as we, that I hope we'll get in. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay, thanks, Senator Waters. Senator Rounds of South Dakota is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, let me begin. I, I'm uncomfortable trying to be a Monday morning quarterback looking back at what was a very challenging time for your banks. And yet, I, as part of the due diligence that we're responsible for providing and the look back and the oversight, we're looking not just at what would have appeared to be a failure by management, but by the boards as well, and also a look at the regulators and how they responded. And so, uh, Mr. Becker, for, for you, uh, according to the Federal Reserve's supervisory report released on April 28th, Silicon Valley Bank failed to assess and manage its interest rate risk in its rapidly growing securities portfolio. SVB had breached its long-term interest rate risk limits on and off since 2017 because of the structural mismatch between long-duration securities and short-duration deposits. Over the same period, SVB also removed interest rate hedges that would have protected against rising interest rates. Essentially, when rising interest rates threaten profits and reduce the value of its securities, the management at SVB took steps to maintain the short-term profits rather than effectively manage the underlying balance sheet risks. Now, I had never heard of the term of, of it being considered a, a, a banking 101 discussion with regard to managing the interest rate risks, and yet both community banks, regional banks, and even the larger banks that I've spoken to that have been involved in South Dakota activities all had the same point of view, that this was a banking 101 issue. Could you just share with us the decision to stop hedging interest rate risk? Uh, that tool had been utilized by the bank, and yet you decided to stop it at a time in which it really probably could have assisted you in weathering the storm. Senator, as I outlined in my written testimony, the, the specific decisions around um, hedges uh, and investments were uh, done with by our ALCO committee um, and executed by our treasury team. I don't have access to my documents as I was when I was terminated on um, March 12th. Um, I haven't been get access, given access to that information, so I, I don't uh, I don't have access to that. But to answer it as as best I can, the when I think of the interest rate risk management, um, there's kind of two parts to it. One is the liquidity risk, and then interest rates overall. And as the Federal uh, Reserve said in their findings. We had findings from November of 21, and part of the story that, again, was told is that we didn't respond to them. And again, to my recollection, the feedback that, that I had directly from our internal audit, the feedback I heard directly from our chief financial officer, is that most of those, not all, but most of those were resolved by the middle of 22. So the, the well, feedback... That, may I just... Just, sure. but, it, but in May of 2022, the Federal Reserve issued three governance MRIAs, matters requiring immediate attention, which required a remediation plan by August 31st of 2022, and that may be what you're speaking of. Did SVB actually submit its remedi the remediation plan that was required by the regulators? Did they actually, did you actually submit that to the, uh, to the regulators by the stated due date? Yes, we did, Senator. Uh, did the examiners then at the Federal Reserve view your proposed corrective actions as satisfactory? And if not, what feedback did you receive? 
Senator, to the best of my memory, um, we submitted our response, as you, you do when you have a requirement to be responsive to the regulators. And uh, my recollection is we were still waiting on the specific feedback from the regulators. Were you expecting there to be an enforcement action at that point? Uh, my recollection is actually at the January board meeting and just shortly thereafter, the feedback from the regulators is that we were expecting uh, an enforcement action, a memorandum of understanding, which we acted on immediately. That's the all the way back in January. The, the reason why I ask is because in November of 2022, the Federal Reserve issued an MRA, matter requiring attention for SVP's interest rate risk. The supervisory findings stated that the firm's interest rate risk simulations were unreliable and gave a false sense of safety in a rising rate environment and masked the need to take actions earlier in the rate cycle. Examiners requiring corrective action by June 30th of 2023. I'm just curious, the fact that they had identified the deficiencies, they gave you an MRIA and then an MRA, um, but they didn't expect you to respond until 2023. Did that somehow suggest that they were relaxing their concerns? Is that the way that the bank saw this when they received this additional follow-up from the uh, from the regulators? Senator, I, I can't speak on behalf of the of the Federal Reserve on what they were, uh, you know, thinking when they gave that. No, I'm asking what you thing. thought when you received it. Yeah, I can say what, what my experience was and what I believe the team did. So in my experience, when we get any regulatory findings, we were very responsive. And I believe the GAO report highlighted that feedback from the regulators that they believe we were responsive. And that was certainly my experience that we were responsive to, whether it was an MRA or MRIA, we treated them the same and moved quickly to remediate them as fast as we possibly could. I think the the 30 some odd outstanding at the time would probably suggest differently. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Senator Round. Senator Menendez of New Jersey is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Becker, it has been reported that on January 26, you filed a 10B51 plan. In accordance with that plan, on February 27th, 11 days before your bank failed, you sold $3.6 million worth of stock. Were you aware that Silicon Valley Bank was in trouble when you filed that 10B51? No, Senator, I was not. You were not. In your written testimony, you claim that when you crafted your plan, you believe you were, quote, not in possession of any material, non-public information at that time, close quote. However, in the past two years, the Federal Reserve issued not one, not two, but 30 supervisory findings which identified issues in areas like risk management, board effectiveness, and interest rate simulation and modeling, all of which directly contributed to the bank's collapse. These findings were not publicly available. All of this happened in a two-year span when you and other executives sold $84 million of SVB, SVB stock. So, Mr. Becker, do you think supervisory warnings about your firm's risk management and governance are material information? Senator, I completely understand the question. The regulatory findings are either private and confidential, or the regulators can choose to make a public enforcement action, which they chose not the to do. The question is not what is that process. The question is they decided not to make it public. You had material information. The question is, is that material information or not? I didn't believe it was, sir. You didn't believe it was. 30 different supervisory findings, all of which are elements of the collapse of the bank, and you didn't believe those were material findings. Maybe you can understand why our shareholder or observer on the outside might think differently. Uh, let me ask you this. In 2020, January of 2023, your firm's compensation committee approved cash and stock bonuses to executives and employees for their performance in 2022. According to public reporting, those bonuses were paid on March the 10th, mere hours before regulators seized the bank. Do you believe you and your colleagues earned the bonuses paid on March 10th? Yes or no? Senator, those bonuses were predetermined on a predetermined date, which I was not familiar with when those were going to be paid. 
Do you think those bonuses reflected strong, healthy performance for you and SVP? Senator, those bonuses were determined, at least for the executive team, by the board and by the independent compensation committee. Do you intend to return any of the bonuses you received? Yes or no? Senator, I'm going to cooperate with the regulators as they go through the process to look, look at that specific area. Mr. Becker, I'm sure you're aware that regulators have identified major weaknesses in SVB's incentive compensation program, noting that they, quote, encourage excessive risk-taking to maximize short-term financial metrics, end of that quote. In other words, the incentive structure you and your colleagues put in place rewarded breakneck growth and profitability while need-capping efforts to manage growing risks to the firm. In 2019, a Bloomberg report found that SVB, First Republic, and Signature were the three highest-paying publicly traded banks in the country. It's no coincidence, then, that those banks are now better known for three of the largest bank failures in U.S. history. Clearly, the compensation structure at your institution was not in line with the long-term interests of your shareholders and deposit holders. I hope to work with my colleagues on legislation to rein in risky incentive-based compensation plans that leave taxpayer footing the bill when banks fail. Uh, it seems to me from reading the supervisory reports from the Fed and the FDIC that when S-2155 passed and supervisory requirements on mid-sized banks were relaxed, both SBB and Signature saw that as a green light to rapidly expand without ensuring their risk management and corporate governance practices would keep up. So Mr. Shea, a simple yes or no, is there a difference between the risk management and corporate governance needs of a $43 billion bank and a $110 billion bank? Could you put your microphone on? Yes, and at all times I advocated for measured and different, um, and different regulation for banks. So I didn't think that a $51 billion bank should be regulated the same way I'm as a $2 trillion I'm bank. I'm glad to hear you say that now because it's too little too late. According to the FDIC, Signature's management, quote, pursued rapid, unrestrained growth without developing and maintaining adequate risk management practices and controls appropriate for the size, complexity, and risk profile of the institution. Now, as I sit here, I hear you testify all collectively that you did everything right. Something happened because the banks failed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator, Nine, Senator Kennedy of Louisiana is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, uh, gentlemen for being here. Mr. Becker, when, uh, when interest rates go up, the price of government bonds, especially long-term, long long-maturity government bonds, goes down, doesn't it? Yes. And you don't have to be Einstein's cousin to know that, do you? No, you don't. Okay. Now, your bank had 55% uh, of its assets invested in government bonds, didn't it? Roughly, yes. And the Federal Reserve raised interest rates, didn't it? Yes, it did. And the value of your assets went down dramatically, didn't they? Yes, it did. Okay. And, and you didn't have hedges, did you? Senator, as previously mentioned, the decision around hedges was made by our Asset Liability Committee. Mr. So Becker, you were the CEO of the bank. You didn't have hedges, did you? Senator, there were hedges that were put in place, but I don't recall the details around when they were put in place. And You're the CEO, and you didn't, you had 55% of your assets in government bonds, and you don't know whether you were hedged or not? Senator, as previously mentioned, I don't have access to my SVB documents, so... <coughs> well, here's, I, I know that, and I wasn't CEO. You weren't hedged. Now, if you'd bought those hedges, that would have cut into your profits, wouldn't it? Senator, I don't know the details of the decisions that the team were evaluating. But if you bought a hedge, the hedge costs money, and it would have decreased your profits, wouldn't it? Do hedges cost money? Yes, they do. And so if you bought hedges, you'd have less money, right? 
Senator, it depends upon, yes, they would cost money, but it depends upon how they And if you'd funded. made less money, that would have affected your bonus, wouldn't it? Senator, our compensation was predominantly long-term in nature. And so I know there's been lots of discussions about compensation being short-term. Mr. My Becker, you made a really stupid bet that went bad, didn't you? Senator, and the taxpayers of America had to pick up the tab for your stupidity, didn't they? Senator, there were a series of events, unprecedented events that occurred that led us to where we are today. No, this wasn't unprecedented. This was bone deep, down to the marrow, stupid. You put all your eggs in one basket. You put all your eggs in one basket, and unless, unless you were living on the International Space Station, you could see that interest rates were rising and you weren't hedged. Uh, can you play the video for me? Mr. Shea, I want to ask you. Play it. That still looks like me. <laughs> Fortunately and or unfortunately, yes. It does. Don't Look, the only way we're going to do this thing is if we start a bank from scratch. Start from scratch? you got to be kidding. How in the world do you do that? Is there a book, How to Build a Bank for Dummies? All we have to do is apply to 19 federal and state banking agencies. Wouldn't it be easier just to go out and buy a bank? We looked at that, but the prices are too expensive and... We'd, we'd be stuck, stuck with all their legacy issues. issues. We have to make our own mistakes. But then we'd have nobody to blame but ourselves. We'd have nobody to blame but ourselves. We'd have nobody to blame but ourselves. That is the stupidest thing that I have ever heard. We're sick of the stank of the big mega bank social stock one. It's absurd. What a terrible proposition. Like convincing the world to eat kale. What possible fate? will become of our bank other than to diminish and fail. I happen to know for a fact that won't happen. Seriously? Why not? Because we'll start signature. Mr. Shea, you're in that video, aren't you? Yes, I'm in that video. And you showed that video to the public? Um, that video was designed as a morale boosting. But did you show it to the public? To, it was uh, shown at the employee parties and used, shown for. But did um, the public see it? They may have seen that, yes. And, and you were trying to invite people to take their hard earned money and trust, and trust it to you to spend it wisely, and you showed them this video? That video had a positive impact on yeah, employees and colleagues who enjoyed, who enjoyed watching your bank went and broke. participating. Well, how much time did you spend? You, you conducted pronoun seminars, didn't you? Uh, I, What's a pronoun seminar? Um, I uh, introduced a seminar organized by 300 of my colleagues, just as I went to yeah, but Ping tell me what it is. You, let, you, entered, you, you spent a lot of time doing pronoun seminars, uh, lecturing people about how they ought to use the right pronoun, gender-neutral pronouns, didn't you? I actually spent no time beyond introducing that. Well, I, I could show the seminars, but I won't do it. I was. What did that Senator, Senator Kennedy, your time has expired. Senator Reid from Rhode Island. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Never Turner. mind. Is that for them or for me, John? No, that's not for you. Okay, thank you. Uh, gentlemen, uh, this is a moment in which uh, the American public wants some very uh, direct uh, answers. Uh, and let me turn first uh, to Mr. Becker. Uh, the Federal Reserve report found that SVB repeatedly breached its internal risk limits for interest rate exposure for years. SVB also had persistent shortfalls in its liquidity positions following repeated poor performance on internally conducted stress tests. Mr. Becker, did you, did you know about these breaches and shortfalls? Uh, Senator, as far as the interest rate 
uh, risk breaches, I don't recall. I do recall the liquidity breaches, and it really came from the feedback that we received from the regulators in the, towards the end of 2021. And as previously stated, to my memory, the majority of those were res resolved, and in fact, in February of 23, my recollection is the breaches were all remediated with the exception of one that we expected to remediate in the short term. But you had no uh, knowledge that of interest rate exposures that were reported by the Federal Reserve. I, so I know we received the MRA towards the end of 22. That's my recollection. And I remember our team was working on resolving that. It's hard to conceive of a CEO of a bank not being attuned on almost minute by minute the basis to interest rate uh, exposures, uh, since that's one of the essentials of, of banking. I'm not an expert, but I don't think I'd be contradicted. Uh, so you did not share with the board any knowledge of interest rate difficulties? Senator, any regulatory finding was disclosed with our board of directors. So all that information would have been shared with them. And the specific committee that was involved in interest rate risk management, uh, in the decisions around investments, would have been our finance committee. And who chairs that finance committee? Who chaired it the last year? The chair of the finance committee was Joel Friedman. Joel Friedman. And, uh, but you claim that you have no knowledge of these interest rate difficulties. Senator, we treat all regulatory findings um, seriously. That was a matter requiring attention, which is at the lowest level of feedback that we would receive. And yes, we were in the middle of addressing it, but from our standpoint, it was, again, at the lowest level of feedback. Now, I understand that you did not have a risk officer in place for the last year of the operations of the bank, that that officer resigned early in uh, the year and there was no replacement. Is that accurate? Senator, it was a mutual decision for the CRO to, to leave the organization in April. And we covered that in two ways. One is by covering, by putting together an office of the CRO, which had the leadership team of risk management reporting in to me, as well as the chair of our risk committee. We kept our chief risk officer on board as a consultant in case questions came up to make sure we didn't have any gaps during that period of time. We hired our new chief risk officer in October of 22, and she started in December. Uh, was the uh, focus of the uh, disagreements uh, the fact that the risk officer was warning you of the dangers that you were deliberately running? And as a result, you wanted that person to be uh, removed from the bank and that the consultant fee is a convenient way to pay someone to go away? Senator, the feedback on making a change with the chief risk officer was actually from our regulators and from our board of directors. And so, no, from my perspective, that was not the reason behind it. Well, it just seems that for a whole year almost preceding the collapse of the bank, you had an ad hoc risk organization when you were facing serious challenges, which have been identified here in terms of your assets, in terms of your uh, uninsured deposits, in terms of a host of things. And so it gives the impression that there was not a lot of sensitivity or interest in facing the problems that you faced. And consequently, the, the U.S. government had to bail out you and many of your shareholders, and uh, uh, that can't happen again. Thank you. Thanks, Senator Reed. Senator Haggerty of Tennessee is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member. Appreciate you holding this hearing. Um, Mr. Becker, I'd like to start with you and turn the conversation to what seems to be an apparent failure of supervision by the San Francisco Fed. I'd like to break my questions with you up before the receivership took place and then what happened in the days that followed that. First, just to dimension your relationship, how frequently did you meet with the San Francisco Fed supervisors? 
I met personally with the San Francisco uh, Fed, members of the San Francisco Fed supervision team, um, roughly monthly, and in some months, months it was even, even more frequent than that. How large was the team that they had dedicated to SVB? I would estimate the team was around 15, I believe, is what was quoted by the Federal Reserve. Were they working on site and in person, or were they working remotely? My meetings that I had were mostly uh, remote, and that really was a carryover from the um, you know, pandemic and the remote work that took place, and the fact that SVB had a hybrid structure, so we were working mostly remotely as well. What about in the weeks and the days leading up to the receivership? Did anything change with respect to on-site, in-person supervision? Senator, I guess one, one point to make is that that happened so fast. So really, the, the bank run occurred, started to occur on Thursday, and then that was the day... I had, let me, let me turn my another question. What kind of communications did, that you had from the San Francisco Fed? I'm, I'm really interested in the balance between communications regarding interest rate risk, maturity risk, versus other risks like climate risk. you share with me the balance of those communications? Senator, the, the vast majority, 95, 98%, maybe even 99% of the discussions we had were what I would say is would be traditional fundamental risk. Um, it is governance, controls, liquidity, capital. Um, that would include climate risks. Senator, I, I don't recall with the supervisory team that we had directly where we spent time. I don't recall spending any time. I, I know you were on the board of the San Francisco Fed. I just found it interesting that they're writing about climate risk when they don't have any expertise doing that. Let's turn to what happened um, after the receivership took place. Um, I actually was in California and I visited your headquarters that weekend. I expected to see a parking lot full of cars, people working around the clock doing everything they could to try to help the FDIC manage this auction process to deliver the best possible result for taxpayers given where we were at that point in time that weekend. There were no cars in the parking lot. And that prompts a question from your testimony. You said that you made, quote, every effort to, quote, minimize or eliminate any losses that might result from the FDIC's takeover of SVB, including, quote, seeking to engage potential acquirers before you were let go Sunday the 12th of March. Just to give me a simple answer, yes or no, were you substantively involved in helping the FDIC navigate the sale process? Senator, the FDIC took over SVB on that Friday, March 10th. Um, I offered several times to engage potential uh, acquirers to run through a list of the names or priorities who I believe would be the most likely. Did they ever consult you? You said you offered, but did the FDIC consult with you? They did not. That's amazing. I want to turn to you, Mr. Shea. We're running out of time here. By public accounts, in March, on, on March the 9th, Signature Bank had $4.5 billion in cash, over $26 billion in marketable liquid securities, and roughly $25 billion in borrowing capacity. If you combine that with the federal liquidity programs that were put in place over the weekend of March 11th and 12th, it appears that Signature was neither insolvent nor illiquid. At the very least, it seemed that it would have had the tools at its disposal to navigate all of this. So my question for you, and you noted this in your testimony, it's your view that Signature was not only well-capitalized and solvent, but also had well -defined, a well-defined and solid plan to continue in operation and withstand additional withdrawals. If that was the case, why do you think Signature was placed into receivership? I did believe that we had a plan to continue to be able to open on Monday morning and in the future indefinitely. Um, we were at all times solvent and well capitalized. Um, and um, uh, even with the sale of the um, uh, our available for sale securities, we still have, would have remained well capitalized. So could it be what, what some have said, even some of your board members have said, could it be because of your exposure to the crypto industry and to digital assets? Could that be the rationale? Could that be the reason that you were shut down? I don't know what the reasons, I can't speak for the regulators and their decision making process. I just think it's quite interesting that to this day the FDIC sold off all the assets with the exception of the digital asset portfolio. Is that still the case? I, I don't know the answer. I have no involvement. What about with Signet, the system that you built? Is that still? I is that do not know what happened to it. OK. 
Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Senator. Senator Van Hollen of Maryland is recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Becker, you would agree, uh, would you not, that you had a duty to your shareholders and a duty to your depositors? Yes, I would. So I'm looking at the year 2022, and I'm looking at a dramatic drop in the stock price of Silicon Valley Bank. I'm looking at a huge increase in the amount of uninsured deposits. And I'm looking at your end of 2022 bonus of $1.5 million. So my question to you is very simple. Sitting here today, do you believe you should have received a $1.5 million bonus after the performance indicators I just referenced? Senator, if I could clarify one, one point. The uninsured deposit level from a percentage percent, it didn't, didn't change during 2022, at least to my knowledge, it didn't. It had been at that level for as long as I can remember. Um, as far as the, the compensation, that was determined by the board of directors, signed off by the board of directors based on the performance, uh, their evaluation of that performance in 2022. Well, I'm, I, have to, I have to question, knowing the facts as we do today, uh, the judgment of the, the board of directors. Mr. Chairman, I would like to submit for the record, uh, a, a article from the Financial Times entitled Executive Pay at Silicon Valley Soared After Big Bet on Riskier Assets. Without objection, so ordered. And I want to read from another Financial Times article that really analyzed what happened uh, in 2022. And, and they start by saying the weakening profitability of SVB in 2022 led SVB to do something they say really dumb. In the first quarter, it unwound $5 billion in AFS hedges, available for sale hedges, to book a $204 million gain. And in the second quarter, it dumped another $6 billion of hedges to lock in a $313 million gain. Mr. Becker, do you question those facts? Senator, the only thing that I would, I would, I don't know the details on, my understanding is the when you cash out a hedge that the um, benefit of that is actually amortized over the life of that hedge which could be anywhere from four five or six years so it wasn't taken into income at that point in time right but i i guess you you don't contest the facts about what i what this article just printed right just want to make sure <laughs> with the exception of the period of time which that is taken into income well okay so do you agree with the Financial Times analysis that this was really dumb? Maybe you didn't know it at the time, but looking <laughs> where you are today, can you agree that that was a really dumb move? Senator, as outlined in my written testimony, the decisions around the hedges were actually overseen by our Asset Liability Committee and our Finance Committee. I have every reason to believe they were making the best decisions they could at that time, not in a short-term basis, but over the long run. And I don't have access to my documents to really confirm that. Well, Mr. Becker, I think the, the problem we have here is, is the facts tell a very different story. And what the facts suggest is that in the face of declining profitability and falling share price, you and the bank decided to essentially artificially goose your profits by making these sales, which put the bank in a much more precarious situation with respect to interest rate risk. And it appears from everything I've seen that when the board of directors provided the bonus, one of the things they considered was this short-term short -term bump in the, in the gains from the sales of these more liquid, these, these assets. So the bonus was received in the end as a result of taking the risky behavior that ultimately led to the collapse of SVB, ultimately led to the loss of complete value for shareholders, and ultimately led to the FDIC having to come in to support depositors. So we are in the process in this committee looking at different mechanisms to claw back executive compensation. 
uh, that we think was wrongfully gained in the sense that it wasn't deserved. And you answered the question about how your board found that you deserved. I'm asking you today, knowing everything you know, do you really think that taking a, getting a bonus of $1.5 million, given the showing in 2022 and just a short time before the total collapse of the bank, do you believe you deserve that? Senator, to, to the point you made about focusing on short term, I, I respectfully disagree with that. And I believe the board did the best job they could in evaluating the performance that we had in 2022. Well, this is, this is why I think people watching this hearing are just going to be scratching their heads and get angrier and angrier because this is clearly an example where bonus was not tied to performance, not even at the end of the year, and certainly what the trend showed in terms of total collapse. And this is why people have very little faith uh, in much of our financial system. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Becker, please answer the beginning of the first part of uh, Senator Van Hollen's question about whether you, whether you believe you deserve that. Senator, I, from the standpoint of that compensation, that's determined by the Board of Directors. And so I know they believed it was fair, and I believe that they were accurate. Thank you. Uh, Senator Tills from North Carolina is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Gentlemen, thank you for being here. Uh, Mr. Becker, I, I wanted to ask you a question. First off, for people watching this may not know the, the abbreviations, matters requiring attention or matters requiring immediate attention means that a supervisor has identified an area of risk that's unchecked. Uh, I just want to make sure that uh, I've got my timeline right. By July of 2022, following the issuance of numerous MRAs and MRIs, SVB was placed into a supervisory review and flagged for poor governance, controls, and overexposure to interest rate risk. This was in July of 2022. In early 2023, and incidentally, this is based on the Fed's supervisory review, a document we just uh, received recently. In 2023, the supervisory review was escalated to a horizontal review an elevated tier that is designed to assess the viability of risk management at a firm. The horizontal review also identified additional deficiencies. Is that the correct order that this occurred? Um, Senator, I do, you gave a lot of dates. I have to go back and take a look at that to confirm. So okay, if, you, I, if that was in the Fed report, I have no reason to believe it wasn't accurate. Okay. And then... Uh, a, a broader question I want to ask you over the past couple of weeks since the, the uh, months now, almost, uh, since the failure, um, the argument here has been all the management was incompetent, it was a management failure, or the other end of the spectrum, all the supervisors were incompetent, it was a supervisory failure. I kind of fit somewhere in the middle uh, saying that there were actions. I look at these MRAs and MRIAs. Uh, the, the fact that you didn't have a chief risk management officer didn't mean you didn't have a risk management function. Uh, but it does concern me with the length of time, and it, it looked like, because we were also seeing where the Fed was going to go with interest rate risk, that there had been... Tell me about the Manhattan Project that y'all were working on after you got the MRAs and MRIs that haven't been discussed here, or if there was one. How aggressively were you trying to resolve these deficiencies that were identified by the supervisors? Senator, we were aggressively working on them. And I know in the, in the federal report, they talk about dates when findings were, were given. Th those findings in writing typically are done you know, months and months after the initial verbal feedback. And when we respond, we respond not to the, not waiting for what's in writing, we respond immediately upon the feedback we receive when it's, when it's given. And that's the approach that, that I have always taken, and that's the approach that our team took as well. Mm -hmm. They, when they escalate from a supervisory review to a horizontal review, uh, it, it seems like things weren't getting better. W what specific actions did you take in response, in response to the supervisory uh, function that, that you think were responsible? And did, do you feel like in, in reaction to any of the supervisory 
involvement uh, that you acted promptly and decisively on the risk that they were asking you to manage? Uh, I believe, Senator, that we were responsive to, to all the findings, not, not, you know, which findings, but all the findings. And let me give, maybe if I could give one example. So the, a lot of dis discussion has been around liquidity and the findings around liquidity that occurred. In and as you answer the question, so I'm going to give you time, uh, could you also tell me how many of those MRAs and MRIs were still outstanding on the days uh, of the bank's failure? But go ahead. Sure. Um, and I'll answer your last question first. There were 31 that I think has been uh, clearly reported by the Federal Reserve. Um, the ones that specifically related to liquidity risks that actually were given in roughly November of, of 21, they were immediately reacted to um, by our CFO, by our Treasury team, and overseen by our ALCO committee and our Finance Committee of the Board of Directors. Mm -hmm. And to my, my memory, by the middle of 22, the vast majority of those findings had already been remediated. And I believe even in early 23, my recollection is there was roughly one of those findings that were outstanding. So the team, again, from my standpoint, was very responsive to the regulatory feedback, specifically in the area of liquidity. Overall, they were, but specifically in the area of liquidity. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks, Senator Till. Senator Warren of Massachusetts is recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding this hearing. You know, the last time this committee received testimony from Mr. Becker, the CEO of Silicon Valley Bank, he was lobbying Congress, us, uh, to do away with the Dodd-Frank rules designed to protect our nation's banking system. Now, unfortunately, too many people in Congress listened, and now here we are, three bank collapses later, picking up the pieces of Mr. Becker's successful efforts at deregulation. In recent reviews of the failures of SVB and Signature Bank, regulators found that weakened bank rules helped cause this crisis. They also found that each of the witnesses here today were repeatedly warned that their extreme risk-taking was dangerous. Now, instead of paying attention to those warnings, Mr. Becker, Mr. Shea, and Mr. Howell took on more risks so they could boost their own paychecks. Mr. Becker, you were SVB CEO from 2011 until it failed in March. In 2019, the year after Congress gave you what you wanted and voted to weaken the banking system's guardrails, you got a 35% pay bump. Not, not bad for a single year. In fact, your pay increased by nearly $3 million. Now, that same year that you got the pay bump, nearly five years ago now, how many active supervisory issues had the Fed identified and warned your bank about? Senator, I don't, I don't recall the specific number that we would have had in 2018. Well, you ran the bank, Mr. Becker. Do you want to take a guess? One, two, a dozen? I would guess it would be in the 10 to 15. Well, 17, 17, same year. You got a $10 million paycheck. The Fed had warned SVB of 17 unresolved supervisory issues. Now, your bank had issues with capital planning. It had issues with liquidity risk management. And the bulk of the issues identified by the Fed focused on weak governance. It was a litany of management failures. By the time SVB failed, more than four years later, it had 31 unresolved, that's what the public record shows, 31 unresolved supervisory issues. But the big paychecks for you kept rolling in. During that four-year period, you collected almost $40 million. Mr. Becker, the collapse of your bank cost the FDIC fund about $20 billion, money that someone is going to have to make up. Big banks, community banks, depositors, consumers, somebody. So I want to know about basic accountability. How much of the $40 million that you earned from loading up SVB Bank with risk are you planning to return to the FDIC? Senator, if I could clarify one point, and then I'll answer your, your, your question. Um, 
Compensation, I know there's been a lot of discussion about is it long-term or short-term, and it's short-term focused. I, I have a very simple question. You cost the FDIC fund $20 billion. You made $400 million doing that. How much are you planning to return to the fund? Senator, I disagree with the number you just quoted. But what, you don't, that's not your paycheck? Or it's not how much it costs the FDIC? Senator, Those are both a matter of public record. How much are you planning to return to the fund? Senator, the number you just quoted was $400 million. Uh, $40 million, sorry, $40 million. So I was million. disagreeing with that. How much of the $40 million are you planning to return? How many Senator, times are we going to do this dance? Senator, I promise to cooperate with the regulators as they do. Are you planning to return a single nickel to what you cost the fund? Senator, I know there's going to be a process review of compensation. I'll take that I'll as a no. All right, so let's turn to our next one, Mr. Shea. Mr. Shea, Signature Bank's leadership was right there with Mr. Becker. Mr. Shea, you were the chair of Signature's board for the entirety of its 22-year existence. I understand you were also the chair of the risk committee for 22 years. So let me ask you, in 2019, once Congress weakened the laws, how many formal warnings from the FDIC about your bank's liquidity risk management issues were outstanding? Don't know? Does number 18 sound right? Yes. Yeah, okay. In fact, you were still chair of the risk committee in 2020, 2021, and 2022 when Signature received more warnings from the FDIC and, quote, never adequately addressed the liquidity risk management concerns. So from 2019 to 2023, while the FDIC identified an additional 45 liquidity risk issues, you racked up more than $20 million in pay. So, Mr. Shea, the collapse of your bank cost the FDIC fund $2.5 billion. So how much of the $20 million that you earned from loading up Signature Bank with risk are you planning to return to the FDIC? I believe that Signature Bank was a what responsibly managed bank, solvent until the end. Yeah, well, I'm and sorry. Your is, opinion on I what is not. a responsibly and managed is, bank no. is now laughable. So you're planning to return how much? The answer is none. That's I it? I'm not planning to do so, no. Okay, so here's the thing. Right now, the law says that people like Mr. Becker and Mr. Shea can come to Washington they can lobby for weaker bank regulations. They can load up their banks with risk. They can pay themselves tens of millions of dollars in bonuses and stock options. And when the banks blow up, Mr. Becker and Mr. Shea get to keep all the money. And that is just plain wrong. And if we don't fix it, every CEO for these multi-billion dollar banks will keep right on loading up on risks and blowing up banks, and everybody else is going to have to pay for it. And that is why Senator Cortez Masto and Senator Hawley and Senator Braun and I have introduced a bill to claw back these crazy paychecks and make it just a little less profitable for bank CEOs to blow up the banking system. I'm working with a bipartisan group right here on the banking committee, and I hope Congress does the right thing and that we get to mark this bill up, I ask respectfully, uh, as soon as possible. Thank you, Senator Warren. Thank you. Expired. Uh, Senator Vance of Ohio is recognized. Uh, thanks to the chair uh, and to the ranking member for hosting this uh, important hearing. Uh, thanks, gentlemen, for coming before the committee and, and, and testifying today and answering our questions. You know, as I've noted before in this committee, uh, SVB, where I'm going to focus my line of questioning, had a peculiar business model that relied heavily on cushy perks for VC clients. It's a business I know well. It was the business I was in before I joined this body. 
Now, this undoubtedly added their heavy concentration in tech and venture capital, but by now we all know that it exposed not just their own banks, but our entire financial system to a peculiar, peculiar type of risk. It meant the Silicon Valley Bank had a large number of uninsured depositors relative to other commercial banks. It also meant that Silicon Valley Bank it was engaged in a number of very risky business practices that eventually unwound the bank and led to the situation that we have before us. But if the executive's failure to manage risk wasn't enough, we've also seen some suspicious behavior in the lead-up and aftermath from the failure of your former bank, Mr. Becker, and that's why I want to direct my questioning uh, to you. So just as a starting point, Mr. Becker, I, I, I want to focus more on the short term. Elizabeth, uh, Senator Warren was, was focused on the longer term here. But what were the amounts of your cash bonuses in 2021, do you recall? 2021, I believe, was $3 million. And your cash bonus in 2022 was? $1.5 million. So in 2022 in particular, you paid yourself a $1.5 million cash bonus, even as the stock, the value of the company that you were managing declined by two-thirds. That's not bad work if you can get it. As uh, Senator Kramer and I were joking, uh, we would be willing to screw something up for much less than $1.5 million. Um, the stock price fell in 2022. So it's pretty clear the cash bonus was still $1.5 million despite SVB stock falling by two-thirds that same year. Now, do you think it's appropriate to pay yourself $1.5 million when the stock of the company you manage declines by 65 percent? Senator, the two points to your question first Please. is that the um, determination of my compensation is made by the board of directors and their assessment. And the second part relating to this question on stock I held roughly five times the amount of stock that I was required to, and so clearly I was impacted when the stock price so, declined. So, Mr. Becker, you say that the decision was made by the board of directors, so let's focus on them. Do you think that they were wise to award you $1.5 million in cash compensation bonus when the decline of the stock price was 65 plus percent? Senator, I believe they looked at the performance against the goals that were set up, and they know that I was significantly impacted by the decline in the stock price. So, Mr. Becker, it's been reported on February 27th, you sold a significant amount of SVB stock. What was the total market value of the shares that you sold on February 27th, just a couple of weeks before your bank was put into receivership? The 10B51 plan that was entered to in January was for options that were set to expire. They were issued back in 2016, and they were options that would have expired in May of 23. But you sold the stock in February of 23. What was the price of the stock that you sold? Uh, the, the value, I believe, at the total shares was $3.6 million or $3.5 million. Okay, so about $3.5 million literally weeks before your bank was placed into receivership. Do you think that was an appropriate decision to sell millions of dollars of stock a couple of years before, to Senator Warren's point, uh, the FDIC was forced to come in and save your uninsured depositors to the tune of $20 billion? Senator, this, the stock sale, as I outlined in my written testimony, was made under a 10B51 plan that was done just after we released our fourth quarter numbers to protect against information that would be different over time. I signed off on it, and so did our legal team to say that we didn't have material non-public information. So, so, so let's assume that it was illegal. I'm sure that if it wasn't, that information will come to light. Do you think it was ethical? Think about this. American taxpayers, American consumers are going to be paying higher banking fees, fees because of the $20 billion that the FDIC put into Silicon Valley Bank. Do you think that it's ethical to take $3.5 million in stock sales just a couple of weeks before the bank fails? Senator, that plan was legally entered into in January. I understand it was legal. I'm trying to get into something a little bit deeper here. Did you have any idea two weeks before when you sold the stock publicly that something was amiss at your own bank, that you were weeks away from being placed into receivership by the FDIC? No, I did not. So one final question, Mr. Becker. You know, I, I believe maybe it's an old, uh, it's an old honor code, but uh, when a ship's about to go down, the captain should go down with the ship. The first full day that your bank was in receivership was the Monday after. The bank was placed in receivership by Friday. Uh, the first full day was Monday. Where were you on Monday? Were you at the office in Silicon Valley Bank? Senator, I was terminated on Sunday, and I had no interaction with any of my team and I offered 
to do anything I could to help the FDIC to market the bank to find the best home for our clients and the best home for our employees. My wife and I made a decision. We decided we were going to go to one of two places to be with family. Either we would be with my family in Indiana or her family in Hawaii. So let me, so let me just follow up. go to Hawaii. Just one final question, Mr. Chairman, if I may. Just on, on that point, you, you're, you were terminated on Sunday after the bank was put into receivership, Mr. Becker. You, you're saying the FDIC was not interested at all in your services or in your help the following week? Senator, I offered several times over that weekend to help prioritize potential acquirers because I felt I was in the best position to help understand who were banks that competed with us. Who were the likely banks that were to acquire us, to find a home for our employees, to find a home for our clients? And they didn't take me up on that advice. And I, I, they were put into a difficult situation, so I, I'm, I'm not faulting them. I don't know why they did that. I'm just telling you the facts around it. I appreciate that, Mr. Becker. I'm mindful of my time here, but that's an interesting fact in and of itself. Mr. Chairman, I yield. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Vance. Uh, Senator Tester of Montana is recognized. Thank you, Chairman. And thank you for holding this hearing. Uh, Mr. Becker, at Silicon Valley Bank, you were um, concentrated in a highly volatile interest industry at the time when things were looking rocky in many of your clients' businesses. You didn't just have a lot of uninsured deposits. You had mostly uninsured deposits. And those startup tech clients were in a position where they needed to burn through cash faster than it was coming in. In recent years, your bank has grown uh, rapidly, uh, but investments, uh, your bank paired with that growth, uh, may have been safe assets, but they were going to rapidly lose value with interest rates increases that the Fed made clear and everybody in the industry knew was coming. The Fed had clearly signaled to any banker, to any investor, to anybody paying attention that to get inflation under control, they were going to raise interest rates. And in fact, you even sat on the San Francisco Fed's board of directors during that same time period. And the chairman of your board came from one of the big four accounting firms. Uh, Mr. Becker, if, if you couldn't see the real risk coming, what were you doing leading this bank? Senator, when the decisions were made to make the investments in the government-backed securities, uh, that was in 2021 mostly, and that's when inflation was stated by the federal government as being transitory. That was the case all the way up until the end of 21 when we had already invested the majority of those securities in government securities. So you're you're in you're in a, you're in a situation where um, um, your bank increased in value. I will say exponentially. You could debate that, but it increased in value very quickly. You're in a situation where your um, a high a high 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 portion of your deposits weren't weren't insured by the FDIC because they were over the the limit. You were in a situation where um, everybody saw the economy moving forward, um, coming out of a pandemic, a lot of pent up demand, um, and quite frankly, um, we saw Congress and others take actions. Um, your clients were highly concentrated in the tech industry you invested um, a large portion into um, uh, government paper. You had regulators that were telling you that you're going to have to change what you're doing or you're going to go broke. Maybe they weren't that blunt. Maybe they need to be that blunt. Um, and it is my, in my understanding that a bank in your size, the regulators literally have an office in your bank. Is that correct? Senator, as, as previously discussed, the, just due to the pandemic, I, most of the engagement yeah. was virtual. So you're saying that the, uh, the regulators did not have an office in your bank? 
Most of the engagement was virtual, and to my knowledge, they didn't have an office. That probably would have changed as we were coming out of the pandemic and people were coming back to the office on a more regular basis, but at the time... When was um, the first time that the, the Fed or any of the, I believe you had three regulators, right? When was the first time they notified you that you had problems? Senator, I, I think about you know, the matter is requiring attention or the feedback we yeah. get from regulators. Matters we're, requiring we're, attention. We're, we're getting that on a regular basis. We're engaging the regulators and so, we are being very responsive to the feedback they were giving us. So what you're saying is, is that, uh, no, uh, I would disagree that you were very responsive with the feedback they were given. Did you read the Fed report? I did read the Fed report. Okay, it, it shows that the regulators identified deficiencies and then quite frankly, um, you didn't proceed with those deficiencies. I don't necessarily blame you for that, by the way, although I do. I blame the regulators. The regulators should have been standing on your front doorstep, not allowing you to go through the door until you fix these problems. So we, we'll take that up later, because I don't want the regulators to overreact and pinch all the folks that are following the rules to like, like happened in 08. But the fact of the matter is, is that it is very hard for me, and I am not in the financial industry, my folks, when I was raised, says if you can't afford to buy it, don't go to a bank. So I've not had a lot of work with a bank. But, but the truth is, it's hard for me to understand how somebody who sat on the Fed, somebody who is in tune with what's going on in the economy, somebody that had regulators telling them, you've got, you've got stuff that has to be dealt with here, didn't take the kind of response that should have been taken. Now, whether it's you as president of the bank or whether it's people on your board of directors, I don't know what happened here, but the fallout of this, by the way, the fallout of this isn't just Silicon Valley Bank going down. It's the fact that we're going to have a lot of banks out there that are going to get, to get the screws put to them because you guys didn't react to the recommendations that were made by the Fed and hopefully other regulators, but absolutely by the Fed. And I just don't understand how for three years this went on and, and nothing was done. And it ends up where that bank no longer exists, right? No longer exists. It does not. Thanks, thank you, Chester. Uh, Senator Daines from Montana is recognized. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Um, I wouldn't trade you guys places this morning and tell you that. The, the failures of Silicon Valley banks Signature Bank and the general turmoil in the banking sector are the direct result of the failures of executives we have before us today. But it's also a failure of financial regulators. I, I served on an executive team of a financially um, sound company, but also publicly traded for many years. Um, I know what it's like to be in an executive team as part of a publicly traded company. But let's not forget the inflationary environment sparked in no small part by the Biden administration's reckless spending over the past two years also were part of this crisis. To put a finer point on it, all of these groups failed to prioritize clear and present risks of this inflationary environment. I remember sitting in this same committee, the Finance Committee and others, and we kept hearing about this transitory nature of inflation when we were screaming that inflation is real, it's coming, and interest rates are going up. But here's the shocking point as we looked and kind of started to unpack what happened out on the West Coast is while all this is going on with these inflationary risks, mitigating risks from climate change was their priority from the, the, the San Francisco district while inflation was wreaking havoc on this economy. We went back and looked at their guideline bulletins they put out. You compare what the San Francisco Fed published Last fall, in San Francisco, in New York, in the 12th and the 2nd Fed districts, it was about climate change, was the, was the top risk identified. The Federal Reserve's recent report did not examine whether there was any discrepancy in the quality of supervision across the various districts, but I think that's a very relevant question. Vice Chair Barr's review found that staff at the San Francisco Fed felt there was a shift in culture 
that contributed to a less assertive supervisory approach. We looked at the 12th district, the San Francisco Fed talked about climate change. As it was listed, number one, priority, stack ranked as the top risk back in October of last year. Compare that to the 5th district, the Richmond district, where they said rising interest rates might be the top risk factor. I mean, I did not come from the banking sector, but we were screaming about that here on Capitol Hill, saying rising interest rates are going to be a major risk factor for consumers in this economy going forward. Vice Chair Barr also simultaneously states that this was the result of tailoring following the passage of S-2155, that landmark bipartisan bill that was enacted in law in 18. I think this is an overly broad conclusion without a review of whether this is something that occurred across all 12 Fed districts. I'd also like to see the Federal Reserve and the FDIC examine whether any specific individuals were negligent in their duties and should be fired. The executives sitting before this committee today lost their jobs. And I think this is appropriate given the harm caused by mismanagement. We should also hold negligent regulators to the exact same standard. Turning to my questions. Mr. Becker, Chairman Brown mentioned his opening remarks, and you confirmed that at the time of SVP's failure, the bank had 31 unaddressed safe and soundness supervisory warnings. By the way, triple the average number when you compare to peer banks. Your testimony is full of metrics suggesting that SVB was comparable to its peers. Well, part of that could be true. There's clearly one metric where SVP was an outlier. You stated earlier in this hearing that almost all the deficiencies were addressed. So my question is, you can help us out on this, did you receive confirmation from regulators that these 31 deficiencies were adequately addressed? Written confirmation, verbal confirmation, some kind of confirmation? Senator, to be specific, my comments were about they were being addressed because part of the discussion is about were we responsive to the regulatory feedback that we received? And the answer that I gave is we were responsive to them. They were definitely not remediated. Okay, so, so they weren't addressed. Okay, so it was, it was, it was in process but not complete. Uh, some of them would have been signed off on. By how, how many of the 31 line? would you say would have been signed off? Do you recall? Um, that were signed off, would have been signed off by internal audit. Again, I don't recall specifically, but I know more familiar with the ones on liquidity. And liquidity, again, to the best of my memory, uh, the vast majority of those were remediated and signed off on by internal audit. Lastly, it's well known that SVB did not have a chief risk officer, the CRO, for the last eight months of 22. In your testimony, you mentioned that SVP's prior CRO was still available as a consultant until October of 22, and that you made several hires to supplement your risk management team. Can you explain why your CRO left the company, and did you lean on her services while she was in a consulting capacity? Yes, uh, the feedback on um, looking to find a CRO with even deeper LFI experience was really at the beginning, end of 21, beginning of 22. And that feedback came from our regulators, from the board of directors, from internal audit, and so that feedback was, was given. We decided to make that change, again, with board input, and even before we made the change, informing the regulators that this was going to happen. My experience is that it takes to find the best executive six to nine months to find that if you're using an outside church firm looking for the best person. We did two things to make sure that we had coverage. One is we created an office of this chief risk officer. Those individuals, which is the risk leadership team of the risk group, reported to me, and they reported into the chair of our risk committee. Second thing we did, to your point, we kept our chief risk officer on board as a consultant um, in case something came up. But the predominant oversight was really done by the office of the chief risk officer. As far as your question, how many interactions or how much engagement was there with the prior chief risk officer? I, I can't say specifically. I had a couple, but I don't know about the rest of the team. Thank, thank, I'm not thank you, Senator Daines. Uh, the yeah. witnesses have asked for a bathroom break. Five minutes, literally, we'll restart. Uh, so you're dismissed for five minutes, if that works. And um, Senator Smith, well, remote, will be next. Thank you.
Now the Banking, Housing, and Urban Affairs Committee is back in session. Senator Sinema of Arizona is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to our witnesses for being here today. Recent bank failures, including those at Silicon Valley Bank and Signature Bank, are textbook examples of executive incompetence, financial mismanagement, and incidentally, the brokenness in Washington. Both the Fed and the FDIC need to make meaningful cultural and operational changes to respond to problems faster and restore confidence in the system. I'm an original co-sponsor of the bipartisan bill, the Financial Regulators Transparency Act, alongside Senators Warren and Tillis and other members of this committee. This bill will ensure we can hold regulators accountable to the cultural and operational changes they pledge to make. We'll discuss this more in Thursday's hearing. Today is about financial mismanagement by bank executives, which is where the lion's share of the blame should rest. Mr. Becker, thank you for being here. Page six of your testimony states that, quote, on the advice of Goldman Sachs, you decided to sell your AFS portfolio first. Did Silicon Valley Bank retain Goldman Sachs as a financial advisor or fiduciary? Goldman Sachs was the investment bank that was uh, running the transaction for us, so they were our advisor. There's a news article today in the Financial Times where Goldman Sachs informed SVB in writing, quote, we would not act as their advisor on the sale, and SVB should not rely on any advice from the bank in this regard, but instead hire a third-party financial advisor, end quote. Is, is that an accurate letter that you received from Goldman Sachs? Senator, I don't remember reading that, that document. Uh, uh, Mr. Chair, I'll just um, submit this for the record. This is an article in the Financial Times today, um, and uh, Goldman Sachs um, provided this information to SVB in writing. So the way you phrase your testimony implies that Goldman Sachs advised you to sell the portfolio like a financial advisor would. But we see here there was a letter where they were not retained as a financial advisor or fiduciary. If they were, you would have a contract. So it seems like they were acting in a principal capacity, perhaps as a bidder for the assets. Did SVB have a financial advisor advising on this transaction in March of 2023? Senator, the the sole investment bank that we were working with at that time was Goldman Sachs. Okay, so either Goldman Sachs did write a letter saying that they would not be your advisor on the sale, or they did. So what did Goldman Sachs advise you in this contract that we're not sure exists and that Goldman Sachs says does not exist? Senator, the only thing I can do is uh, give my memory of what happened. Again, I don't have access to the bank documents, but my, my memory is, is very clear. It was, as we were looking to do two things, one is raise equity, and the second one is to sell all or a portion of our AFS portfolio. Um, Goldman Sachs was our, the investment bank we worked with on, on both. And as we were having the discussion with our board of directors, or specifically the special committee of the board that was really the ones um, working with the management team on this, uh, the direct feedback that we received from Goldman Sachs is that to uh, show the purpose for the fundraise, the capital raise, because otherwise our capital ratios and liquidity was strong, we would need to sell the securities first to show the loss and then to bring the capital on board later that day or the next few days. And was Goldman Sachs your advisor on that sale? On the sale of the securities? That you're just describing, yes. Goldman Sachs was the investment bank that we worked with on that. Hmm. Mr. Chair, it might be useful to try and get a hold of this letter because Goldman Sachs says that they informed SUB in writing that they would not be the advisor on this sale. Um, your testimony faults the interest rate environment for your failure, but I find it fascinating that other institutions, all of which were dealing with the same interest rate increases, seems to have hedged better than SVB. So why do you think other buy banks survived in the same environment where your bank failed? Senator, as I tried to describe in my written testimony, I actually think the unrealized losses across the banking sector just the securities, but also, and I think this is not as well discussed, the loan portfolio. So when banks have loans that are longer duration, those unrealized losses exist. I tried to highlight the fact that our loan portfolio is short duration and was variable rate, 90% of it. 
So when you look at the entire balance sheet and you look at duration and interest rate risk, I think you have to look at all the assets on a balance sheet. And so our loans would reprice every day or when rates would increase. So we benefited from that as rates um, went up. And so the discussion around the securities portfolio is because it was really offsetting the variable interest rates we had in our loan portfolio. Mr. Oh, Senator Brett. Thank you so much. Thank you for being here today and appearing before this committee. It's unfortunate that the policies of this administration have shifted what was a thriving economy just a few years ago to an environment of economic uncertainty and unprecedented inflation. Today, individuals, businesses, and lenders are all facing the challenges of the current high interest rates. We are seeing that in our daily lives across the board. Despite this, banks in my state of Alabama have remained resilient, and I am so proud to be able to say that. The same time, um, that cannot be said of the banks that are represented sitting before us. Mr. Becker, I'm concerned with the lack of responsibility that you have chosen to take for the role that you played leading up to the failure of the bank that you led for the last 12 years. While your written testimony points to a number of issues that you believe are responsible, I think the answer to the question of what happened to your bank lies in the first sentence of the Federal Reserve's 118-page report. It states, Silicon Valley Bank failed because of a textbook case of mismanagement by the bank. Mr. Becker, I believe that good management starts from the top. Given that, you've spoken and spent the last 30 years really immersed in the banking industry and in this profession. You were actually CEO of this bank that grew to the country's 16th largest bank, so I think we can all agree that you're an expert in this field. Given your level of expertise in the banking industry, coupled with your longstanding familiarity with SVB and the individual client base, the risk controls, and the investments, it's hard to understand a scenario where you were unable to predict or see or at least proactively consider what the impact of the changing economic environment would have on your client base and investment portfolio. Let me ask you this, at what point did you begin to see red flags with, return, with regards to the long-term stability of your bank? So Senator, when the two questions, right? So capital liquidity, as I think about it, our capital was very strong all the way up until you can look at um, you know, March, March 10th. And so that was validated okay. by the regulators in several points, liquidity, is the other question. And so when you looked at 22, clearly our clients were impacted mm -hmm. by the economy and rising rates. So when did you see a red flag? We saw in the first quarter of 22 would have been when we started to see um, a slowdown because of the increase in interest rates so, with our client base. So uh, tell me, uh, what did you do wrong? In reflection, looking back over the last five years and particularly the last three, what could you have done differently to prevent this from happening? Senator, I've thought about your question, um, uh, especially over the last eight weeks, pretty much every day. And, you know, it's amazing. I mean, hindsight, we can look at the fastest rate rise. Absolutely. In years and that's what I'm asking you to do. In hindsight, what could you have done differently? We can have the best quarterback in the entire country win a Super Bowl. He even goes back and he dissects film to see when he should have stayed in the pocket longer, when he should have moved here. Everyone does this, especially the teams that lost. You lost and you lost big. When you dissect that, what could you have done differently? Senator, I think about the, the, when we were making the decisions. So the investments and when our team made those decisions. I truly do believe that we made the best so you, decisions you we think, could. Yeah, I only have a minute and 19 seconds left. Let's get to it. There is nothing you think you could have done differently. Senator, if the... No, yes or no. Is there anything you could have done differently? If the team would have known it was going to be the fastest no, no, no. in race in history, I believe they would have considered different decisions. So you still take no responsibility for any of this? Senator, I was the CEO of Silicon Valley Bank. I take responsibility for what ultimately happened. Okay, if you and take responsibility then, will you give that $1.5 million bonus back? Senator, as I previously said, I'm I gonna cooperate with the process that- But I, I mean, will you do it? You, you don't have to, I mean, will you do it? Let's say they say, no, you don't have to give it back. Will you give it back? 
Secretary. Because you said you care about your 8,000 employees and their families. You say you care about everything you've put everyone through. There are uh, CEOs and banks all across this country that are having to pay up for your mistake. You said you went to Hawaii. Did you have a chance to walk on the beach, sit on the beach? And when you did, did you think about what you've done to these people? And if so, will you give back the $1.5 million from your FY 2022 performance? Senator, as I previously said, I'm committed to cooperate with the process, with the regulators and other agencies that I know are going to be looking into that specific question. Okay, well, I hope even if for whatever reason they say you don't have to, I hope that you dig deep and you decide that that needs to be somewhere besides in your pocket. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Senator Brett. Senator Cortez Masto, who's waited a long time from Nevada's next. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Let, let me continue the line of questioning uh, from Senator Britt and so many I've heard this morning of my colleagues. Let me just ask you this, and this is from the May 11th, 2023 GAO uh, report, the preliminary review of agency actions related to the March 2023 bank failures. Let's start with um, SVB. Uh, there's a statement in here and that they say that SVB had exposure to interest rate risk through the investment in longer-term securities to generate yield against its deposits. According to the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco staff and examination documents, the bank did not effectively manage the interest rate risk of the securities or develop appropriate risk management tools for the risk. Federal Reserve and FRBSF staff noted that the SVB bank failed due to ineffective management of its deposits and assets. Mr. Becker, do you agree with that statement? Senator, I think it's important, as I mentioned earlier, yes to or look no. at, Senator, I believe that our team, our ALCO team, Finance Committee, our Treasury team, made the best decisions they could with the information they had at the time. So do you agree with decisions. that statement, yes or no? Senator, I have to go back and just reiterate that the decisions were when the, we were made by our team of people, and I believe they made the best decisions they could. So you disagree with that statement? I believe we were responsive to the regulator's feedback, and I believe our team made the best decisions they could. Uh, let me ask you this, Mr. Shea. The Signature Bank had exposure to deposits from the digital assets industry. This is, again, according to the GA report. According to FDIC officials and examination documents, poor governance and risk management practices prevented the bank from adequately managing its liquidity risk. FDIC officials noted that poor governance and unsatisfactory risk management practices were the root cause of Signature Bank's failure. Do you agree with that statement? I can't speak for the regulators. I can only speak for myself as terms of what I think the root cause was. And I think the root cause of Signature Bank's, um, Signature Bank, the run on Signature Bank was due to a panic that so can I, I had never you, seen you before in my life. So can I ask you, statement that it was poor governance and unsatisfactory risk management practices by by you and others at the bank, is that correct? I can't speak for the regulators. I can only I'm not speak asking you to speak for the regulators. I'm asking you to speak for you. Do, do you think that the poor management of you and your staff contributed to the failure of the bank? I think the root cause was the panic that took place in a few hours on. So um, you disagree? You think it was the, root, I think was, the bank was, was the run on the bank? I think the You board, think it was the run on the bank that caused the failure? Is that what you're telling me? The run on the bank. Okay, Mr. Howe, do you disagree with GAO's statement here that a, a lot the bank's failure uh, had to do with uh, the poor governance and unsatisfactory risk management practices? I don't believe that there was mismanagement at the bank. I do feel that it was the unprecedented events that happened after the seizure of Silicon Valley Bank in the midday on Friday, March 10th, that led to an unprecedented level of withdrawals by depositors that day. And all three of you, as you sit there today, you believe your bank failures were caused by the runs on your banks. Is that correct, Mr. Becker? Yes, the unprecedented. Is that it correct, Mr. Shea? I believe it. Yes or no? I believe it was caused by the run. Mr. Howell, do you, you agree your bank failure was caused by the run on your bank? That's correct. Okay. So uh, what do you think are the appropriate penalties that should be assessed against executives and board members whose banks actually fail? not due to a run on a bank. Mr. Becker. Senator, I believe that's, that answer to that question, that decision is to be made by this committee and the regulators. 
So if it's due to poor management, do you think there's any penalty that should be assessed to the executives and board, board of directors? Senator, I believe that decision rests with this committee and okay, with the Mr. regulators. Shea, if it's due to poor management, a bank failure is due to poor management by uh, its executives and bank failures, do you think should, penalties should be assessed? I, I, that decision should be assessed by Congress and policymakers. Mr. Howe? I believe there is legislation being discussed now, and I really have no position on that. So every bank with more than $5 billion in, in, an, in uninsured deposits will have to bear the cost of the preventable failures of your banks. What do you say to those banks that must pay that special assessment to cover your bank's failure? Mr. Becker. Senator, I think one of the reasons that we're here to testify today is to provide as much information as possible to this committee and to the regulators to understand what happened so that it could be branded. So what do you tell those banks before? that you that are out there that are having to pay the additional cost, the special assessment to cover your bank's failure? Any, any statement or words to them? Senator, as I mentioned in my both written testimony and oral testimony, I'm clearly sorry for the impact that SVB has had on clients and including small business, including uh, small banks. Mr. Shea. I don't have a response. I don't know. Mr. Howe. I have no position on that. So let me ask you one final question, Mr. Becker. If you believe that the run on the failure of your bank was due to a run by individual investors, what was the cause of that run? I think there were uh, several things, Senator. It, again, what I tried to describe it was a series of unprecedented events. It wasn't, it Give wasn't me one. one thing. What was the cause of the investors to run on your one, bank, to take their one, deposits out? One of the factors was the linkage between SVB and Silvergate Bank. And that connection, which I believe was not correct, and linking us together. And that was the cause of the investors it was to, one to of, run on your bank? One of the causes. And what are some of I the believe, others? I'm curious. I believe it was the unrealized losses at our portfolio and the belief that we would have had to sell those securities. How did they find out about that? It's disclosed publicly. By you? Yes. Thank you. Thanks, Senator Cortez Masso. Senator Lemus of Wyoming is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, gentlemen, for being here. Um, I recall when Signature Bank failed that uh, there was a lot of blame placed on digital assets, so I want to explore that a little bit. Uh, Mr. Shea, you put a lot of emphasis in your testimony on your customers in the digital asset industry, and you mentioned in your testimony digital assets 10 times, uh, implying that digital assets was a driver of Signature Bank's collapse. So I want to explore that a little bit. Did Signature Bank hold digital assets? Um, I did not, um, I, Signature Bank did not hold or custody any digital assets, but I just want to clarify and did you trade, one thing. If, did you trade digital assets? No. So the point here is you had depositors that were in the digital asset industry, correct? Yes. They, but they were, the deposits were in U.S. dollars. They were in cash, like any other depositor, correct? Yes, all the deposits were in U.S. dollars. Okay, so according to the New York DFS, uh, deposits from digital asset businesses in cash, not crypto, uh, made up about 18% of total deposits prior to your bank's collapse. Um, also, according to New York DFS, outflows on March 10th were relatively proportional, meaning depositors who had nothing to do with digital assets were responsible for the significant majority of withdrawals during the run. Do you agree with that statement? Yes, I did not point earlier, as in, in the first part of your first question, to digital assets being a particular cause or not. Well, I, you, you used the term 10 times during your testimony. Um, and then later, of course, in, in the previous questions from uh, Senator Cortez Masto, uh, you've You've placed blame everywhere, but, but accepted absolutely none. 
yourselves. Now, from the FDIC, the root cause, this is a quote, the root cause of Signature Bank's failure was poor management. Signature's board of directors and management pursued rapid, unrestrained growth without developing and maintaining adequate risk management practices and controls. Um, so you had regulators um, telling you uh, that there were inadequate uh, risk management controls in your bank, and you allowed them to go unaddressed for a very long time. Why is that? Um, the board was making sure that these were addressed, the, that uh, the board, the uh, bank, was actively trying to ameliorate and making progress in the in the controls. And, um, it and was, what were it the was controls? It was doing such things as raising insured broker CDs, such as seeking to have repo agreements with um, with primary dealers, such as diverse further diversifying its deposit base, such as limiting largest deposits, such as holding high quality shorter term securities holding assets that were um, strong assets, that were, um, that were strong assets, um, continuing to increase kind of doing liquidity stress testing on a, um, on, a, uh, on, a, on a very frequent basis and improving those liquidity stress test models um, to the best of my knowledge um, as, was, uh, I, as was being uh, shown to the regulators. So the bank was from my perspective as chairman of the board, taking active roles to ameliorate and to address those risks in an active basis. Yet on March 12th, uh, there were uh, requests for withdrawals uh, of about eight billion, and there were only about four billion in assets in the bank, correct? Um, I'm not familiar with what those numbers were on, the, on, fr on Friday. There were requests for $18 billion in um, deposit withdrawals, all in the space of a, of a few hours. Okay, so the cash available to fulfill those withdrawals was inadequate. That morning, my, re that morning, my recollection was that the bank had $29 billion in available, um, in available liquidity from uh, the Fe the um, Federal Home Bank and Federal Reserve plus the cash, I believe that number that you mentioned. Well, I noticed that you described in your testimony that, and Mr. Howell, you described it as profoundly disappointing. Mr. Shea, you said it was a devastating day for you. I'm sure it was. It also was for your employees and your depositors. Um, I am a proponent of uh, state chartered banks I'm a proponent of digital asset industries. It looks like there's been a lot of deflection of blame uh, onto those particular depositors that deal in digital assets and onto uh, regulators, but you haven't accepted any blame yourself. Uh, and so uh, I find that disconcerting and disappointing. Uh, I know you're profoundly disappointed um, I can assure you that your depositors are as well. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you, Senator Lummis. Senator Warnock of Georgia is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we've seen this movie before, and we have a sense of how bad it can get. Back during the 2008 crisis, we all remember that many of the bankers who got us into that mess kept their cushy salaries while families across the country lost their jobs, lost their homes, lost everything. Um, I continue to serve my church and I work with communities where the poor and the marginalized middle class people are held to higher standards than this. They miss a single payment and they're slammed with overdraft fees, something I've addressed time and time again on this committee or they have threats of having their car repossessed, their lives turned upside down, missing one payment. Hardworking families, it seems to me, shouldn't have to bail out the bankers or any executive of any company who made risky and uh, unnecessary bets that failed. Mr. Becker, 
What was your compensation over the last year? Senator, as of our proxy for 2022, my compensation that was listed there was, I think, $9.9 .9 million. Okay, so, so close to $10 million, somewhere in that ballpark. If I could clarify one point, Senator, 70% of that is tied to long-term compensation. So just to clarify, that would have been paid out over three to four years, not in the current year. But it's still a lot of money. Yes, it is. Yes or no, because we have limited time. Do you believe that poor management and decision making were principal factors in your bank's failure? Senator, what I tried to articulate in yes, my yes or no? Do, do, do you believe that poor management and decision making were principal factors in your bank's failure? Yes or no? Senator, I believe it was a series of unprecedented events that all came together in the fastest bank run in history. Did you did you make any poor decisions, Senator? Based on a previous question that was asked about looking at in in hindsight, I I truly do believe that with the information we had at the time when we made our decisions, that we made the best decisions that we could have. Yes or no, did you consider the consequences of your decisions on the wider financial system? The number of uninsured deposits you had at your bank, uh, the, the issues that have already been raised here, D did you consider the consequences of your decisions? For these ordinary folks that I'm talking about back at, in Georgia who who would lose their home, lose everything over much smaller lapses. We're just trying to hold it together. They don't, they don't have the high class problem of $10 million over a few years. Do, 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 did, did you consider them when you were making your decisions? Senator, the uninsured depositors that you mentioned, that has been consistent at SVB for as long as I've been involved in the organization. Do, do you think it's fair for small businesses and families to face additional burdens as a result of your failures? Senator, as I mentioned, I, I'm sorry for any impact that's happening with clients or employees, shareholders, to include small business. Right. So I, I understand that the board sets your pay, but you still hold responsibility here. I've heard your answer uh, to my colleagues this morning that you will comply with regulations and legal enforcement if forced to return compensation. I guess I want to ask a, a slightly different question. In the wake of your failure, do you think it's right for you to keep that money? Senator the vast majority of my compensation was in stock, and I held five times that level. It was required by more board of directors because I so believed in the institution. On March 10th, that went to zero because I planned to keep it until after I retired because that's how much I believed in the institution. So you think you should keep the money, the compensation? Is that the answer? Senator, the point I'm making is that I have been impacted by the stock and the, on t March 10th when the stock went to zero. So, you know, I, I guess my point here is, is that it seems to me that as, as we think about this and we look at what we've got to do going forward, we've got to center the concerns of ordinary people, you know, pe people who are just trying to make it, like most Americans, most Georgians. Uh, from paycheck to paycheck. Those are the folks I'm thinking about and I'll be considering as, as we think about what we need to do moving forward. Thank you so much. Senator Fetterman's recognized from Pennsylvania. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, you know, and I'm also, right, Chairman, I'm the last one sp uh, speaking tonight on the- Go for it. Uh, the last one? Last one. Yeah, so I'm the last guy, so there's not, there's not much left on the bones after you know, over two hours of going back and forth. And in fact, I've heard some of my colleagues actually heard that they went to go to Hawaii's after there was a crash of your bank. And I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it. So I, I went up on the internet and it's like, it did happen. It did happen. It did happen. And that's in Fortune. The second biggest bank in US history collapsed. collapsed. And 
chose to go to Hawaii on that. You know, I've never been to Hawaii, and none of my family. I guess I haven't cranked, or excuse me, crashed a, a bank, you know. So given that this is, I'm the last person, I don't have much left to ask, but I will, you know, let me ask you this one particular question uh, to, to put to, to everyone here on that. And it is, it is an inside, is it an inside joke? No, no matter how incompetent or how greedy, the, the government will always bail you out when your bank crashes. I mean, everyone has to know that, right? You know, the, everyone has to realize that no matter, no matter how bad I behave, no matter how big my, my uh, race is, my, my, my bonuses and everything, you know, we will come in and bail it because we can't crash the economy, much the way SV Bib was argued that it was going to crash it. Do you believe that it's a running joke among in the in the circles of, of banking that no matter how bad we behave, you're gonna we're gonna be pulled we're gonna be saved. Take take it anyone, Senator. I, I don't believe that's the case. You really, like because every, every bank you seemingly that that crashed, it's like hey we, we could bail him out. Yeah, this one you know you know crashed, we'll 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 bail them out. So far, everything's been true. So doesn't it feel that uh, now, if a bank really believed that they wouldn't be bailed out, now after bailing them out, these couple of bailouts, they are going to. Do you believe that that is not outrageous, that no matter how, how deplorable your performance is, you are made as whole, and all by, by, by test, test pay papers? So what do you, what do you believe? What if what if they, what if what if we didn't come out and bail out your bank? What would have happened? So, Senator, I would answer the, the question two ways. One is, I think, when people mostly talk about what you just said, it's talking about shareholders, and our shareholders lost their value. From a client perspective, I, I believe it was important and advocated for our clients to be protected. I believe the implications would have been significant. I think the ripple effect that could have happened in the banking industry would have been greater than was already there. I think small businesses would have been significantly impacted. And so I believe that that was appropriate, but obviously I was not part of that process and that decision. Is, is it staggering, is it a staggering response or responsibility that, a, the, that the head of a bank could literally, could literally crash our economy? It's astonishing. That's like if you have, I mean, like, and and they also realize is that 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 now they have it's in a guaranteed a guaranteed way to be saved by no again by no matter no by, by by how, you know. So it's it's you know, isn't it appropriate that the those kinds of the, this kind of control should be more stricter to prevent this kind of thing from going? Or should we just go on and start bailing and sailing whoever bank, regardless of how, how their, their conduct is? You know, I'll give you an example. Uh, the Republicans want to give a, a work requirement for SNAP. You know, for a, 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 a hungry family has to, to have these this kind of penalties or these some kinds of Word working uh, required. Shouldn't you have a working requirement after we sail your bank you, with billions of your bank? Because they seem to be more pre preoccupied uh, when than SNAP uh, and requirements for works for hungry people, but not about pr protecting the ta the tax papers. You know that will bail no matter whatever does about a bank to crash it. Chair? Uh, thank you, Senator Fetterman. I didn't see an eagerness on the panel to answer your questions. Thank you. Uh, I'll close the hearing. Mr. Becker, you've blamed pretty much everyone else for SBB's failures. We've heard that from people on both sides of the aisle, the Fed, your employees, the board, social media. It's hard to believe a 30-year bank executive and CEO for 12 years should have needed a roadmap from the regulators to find the obvious problems that needed to be fixed and weren't. Both banks sadly suffered from an unwillingness to fix known problems. 
the hearings certainly proved that. I think we already thought that. I expect these failures will be a warning to other executives to think about the long term and to address problems, whether or not the regulators have identified them multiple times. Um, thank you for the witnesses, for your testimony, for senators who wish to submit questions for the hearing. Those questions are due one week from today, Tuesday, May 22nd. Witnesses, please submit your responses to questions for the record 45 days from the day you receive them. Thank you again for your testimony today. The hearing's adjourned.